Hello guys and girls and welcome to my latest video. Now that Covid is easing a little and I have the opportunity to get out and about again I thought I would take you on the walks I often like to do with a film camera. I thought it would make a nice change if I took you with me as I walk around and I can talk to you about film photography as we go. Today we are walking around Portsmouth and in this part one it includes the lovely journey I can take from my hometown of Gosport. A day out taking photographs for me is as much about the travelling and enjoying the ambience of the place as taking the pictures themselves. How can you capture the essence of a location if you are just on a fleeting visit? There are lots of things you need to think about when moving from digital to film cameras. Today I'm going to talk about six of them. Number one is if you are used to using a digital camera, the first thing you are giving up is the ability to take lots and lots of pictures, simply pick your favourite from them and then delete the rest. You will also miss taking pictures and then looking in the back of the camera to see how it turned out. With a film camera, you purchase a film with usually 12, 24 or 36 exposures on the roll. You also have to choose what ISO you are going to use as it simply cannot be changed in the camera like it can in the digital. Although I will discuss how this can be done at the end of the video, so do stick around. So, taking point one into consideration, you probably need to think more about how you might take the picture rather than just snapping lots. A good habit to get into is when you see a subject you would like to photograph, providing it's stationary of course, is to look through the viewfinder and compose. Then move to the left and move to the right or maybe move to a different location, always checking through the subject through the viewfinder. This way you can be sure you will have the opportunity to ensure you take the best picture that suits what you are trying to achieve. So if you are happy to take your time and be more selective about taking the picture, then problem one isn't a problem anymore. So the other side is HMS Warrior and that's the naval dockyards and over there you can see uh, one of the aircraft carriers, I don't know which one it is, so the Queen Elizabeth or Prince of Wales. But here's this is Gosport Harbour and that's where we're going over to the other side in the Gosport Green and White Gosport Ferry where we're going to start the photography walk and uh, just so you all know camera I brought with me today yeah, so the camera I brought with me today is this one Olympus Trip uh, 35mm point and shoot effectively on auto Got a bit of a dent on the lens but that doesn't matter Takes great pictures. That's what we're going to use today. I've loaded some Fuji colour film, and, uh, and as we go around on our walk, it's not just about how you take pictures. It's about what you can take pictures of. It's a beautiful sunny day, as you can see. So hopefully, we'll be able to get some great images. So this is my hometown, I'm lucky aren't I? Over there, that big ship you see over there next to the buildings, that's the Isle of Wight Ferry. They sail every, I think, three hours? One of my photography students lives in that block of flats there and they do get the most amazing night pictures of the harbour. If you're wondering what that tower is, well, obviously there's the, the flats, which is called the lipstick, because it looks like a lipstick, but the big tower is the Spinnaker Tower, which lights up at night different colours depending on what it's for. But that's where we're heading over there. That's old Portsmouth Town, where Nelson and his sailors would have been. You'll see all that when the time comes. So 
boxes I put on a face mask, so I better do that. I'm putting on my face mask. So there we go. So although we're post-pandemic in the UK, in a way, it's October 2021, the sign back there said, we recommend you wear a face mask, so fair comment, I will. Here we are sitting at the back of the ferry. I'm outdoors so I'm not going to bother with my mask anymore. Not a bad way to go to work is it? Quite pleased. Now we're going to go across the journey. There's HMS Warrior. That's uh, Royal Naval Historic Dockyard over there. Better look at it from here. This is called Portsmouth Hard. We're coming around to the ferry terminal. That's Portsmouth Harbour Railway Station there. Remember that building, the lipstick? Well, there's a better view of it there. So the next problem I'd like to discuss with the change from digital to film is the long wait to see your results. With digital you simply attach your camera or memory card to your computer and voila, you have all your pictures downloaded and ready to work on in whatever photo editing program you use. With film it first needs to be developed and then the resulting negative scanned or of course printed or both. Normally the images that you load to your computer will be scanned from the negative not from the print. That would be very low quality. Most labs these days, if you ask for prints, will print from a scan negative digitally, just as they would from an image from your digital camera. There are specialist labs around that will print the old-fashioned way using an enlarger and photographic paper. Naturally, there is a much higher charge for this as you are paying for the time and expertise of the guy or girl doing the work. As you can see, it's keen for photographers. I do strongly suggest that to begin with you try lots of different labs so you can find for yourself a lab that you like, the way that they dev and scan your films, and then stick with them. What you get is what you pay for, and normally a good lab will charge around £15 for developing and scanning, 36 exposure film. When you see offers of £3 for a dev and scan, you can be sure it's not going to be of the highest quality. In the old days, well, back in the 60s, 70s and 80s when I was younger, the average film was taken to a high street shop 
where a developing machine was in one room and a printing machine in another. They usually did colour negative film known as the C41 process. For photojournalists and sports photographers and many other kinds of professionals, like wedding photographers, the actual processing and printing were done by a professional printer. The photographer wouldn't actually be involved in the printing process at all. Of course, many art photographers would dev and print their own films to get exactly what they wanted in the end result, like today when they use Photoshop to have total control over every image. Right, well I'm walking this round to where I normally start my photography training walks, which is just up here by the Mudlark statue. Back in the 1940s and 50s, uh, children used to get in the mud and uh, ask for people to throw down their coppers, pennies and tuppences as they were in those days. And people used to throw them down off the pier over there. And the mudlarks would be up to their knees in the mud, collecting the pennies and tuppences. This is in the days when people didn't have a lot of money. A bit like now, I suppose. So that's the statue. This is the entrance to Royal Naval Historic Dockyard. Great big gold balls. I don't know what to say about that really. When the majority of films were taken to the shops or sent away to labs, the very keen amateur would develop their own film, probably in the kitchen and maybe even having a larger tucked away in their loft. I really do believe that if you are serious about film photography, you should at least once have a go at developing your own film. It is incredibly satisfying and with black and white film, it's possible to control the temperature of the chemicals fairly easily. With colour negative film, the C41 process, the chemicals need to be kept at 38 degrees C, which in your average kitchen is quite challenging. However, there are a lot of YouTube videos telling you how. I've even made one myself. So the question you should ask yourself is, what are you in it for? Is it the fact it's film and that makes it feel more real for you? And then you love to make the adjustments in your photo editing software? Or are you thinking about becoming a true film buff and dev and print your own? That is the true beauty of film. You can take it as far as you want, or more importantly, as far as you can afford. It is more expensive than digital, but it gives so much pleasure. If you are prepared to be patient and wait for the results, then problem two isn't a problem either.
location. Oh, hi, just a latte, take away, please. Sure. That's three pounds, please. Just that. Uh, there you go. Great, thank you. As we continue our walk through South Portsmouth, the third problem you may well have with the change from digital to film is if you are a person who insists on pin sharp pictures, you may well be disappointed. With a digital camera and a very good lens, pin sharp pictures from corner to corner are now expected. In fact, when I read some photography forums or watch some YouTube videos, it's actually becoming an obsession. Don't misunderstand me, obviously the subjects you are shooting should be in focus, I'm not talking soft shots here. What I am saying is that when you look at a print, is the focus sharp in every part? Does it get a bit soft in the top right hand corner, or maybe in the bottom left? Does it matter? With an older film camera it's far less likely you will achieve the perfect focus throughout the whole negative. Add to this the film has grain and it's unlikely the whole print will be pin sharp on every micromillimetre. Like I said just now, does it really matter? For example, you take a picture of that solo tree with lovely clouds. Are the people looking at the picture? Studying if the corners are sharp? No, they are not. If you are into lamography, then lens aberrations, shifts, dodgy focus is all part of the finished print. So if you are happy that your pictures may be a little bit soft in the corners and you are happy with that, then problem three isn't a problem. So here you've got the bars and you've got the slug and lettuce there. Nando's wake a mama. All bar one. My go to when I can afford it. And this is the Eden nightclub there. At Christmas it gets rammed. So there you are. There's the Spinnaker Tower. So you see there's three doors on the top floor. So you see the glass floor? So you can run across the grass, glass floor from that height. You can go up there in a lift. And then people come down the side of that when they're abseiling for charity. Absolutely bonkers. <coughs> so that's where we came from over there, if you see the ferry. And the flats. <coughs> get harbour tours from here. And that's all bar one. And then down here we have more bars, more cafes. There's a Costa's down there, a couple of pubs, a couple of restaurants. Yeah, it's all good. And there's the lipstick again. The fourth problem you may encounter as we continue our walk through South Portsmouth with the change from digital to film is the colour of your image. If you like to spend a lot of time on your camera's white balance, tweaking it here and tweaking it there, and to replicate the nat colours as naturally as possible, then film may not be for you. The scanning process itself can add hues or casts to the film that wasn't in the subject, and that's after you take into account the film's natural colour cast, or should we say colour preferences. 
It's just a small example, Kodak Film loves reds. And if you look at any Kodak advert, the pictures will have a lot of red in them. Fujifilm has a preference for green. Again, the adverts tend to show this. When you are thinking about buying a film, the seller's website will usually explain what each film is best suited for, i.e. skin tones, landscape, city, parties, etc. It can be quite complicated with C41 negatives, as all makes of films have a natural cast. For example, if you are planning on printing your own colour negative pictures, you will need to add filters to the enlarger colour drawer. You may need to add 22 cyan or 12 magenta as a starting point. Then test and add or subtract filtration to get the natural colour you desire. It can be a very long and laborious job if you are not well practised. Mind you, I suspect very few of you are planning on printing your own colour negatives with an enlarger. When you are loading your scan negatives into your photo editing software, you will of course be able to sort out any colour casts then. The problem is really only a problem if you wish to print from an enlarger. However, I think it is important you understand, as stated, that different films are better suited to different situations. And surely the whole point of going to film is to take advantage of the film's quirks. I have always loved Fujifilm and like to play and experiment with Provia and Superior. In fact, a great many photographers are singing the praises of how Fuji digital cameras have the ability to recreate the Fujifilm colours. But however, perhaps it's even better to actually use the real film. If you use black and white film, then of course colour issues are not something you need to worry about. And I haven't even mentioned slide film, as that deserves a whole video to itself. On this our last section of a walk through Portsmouth in part one, we can discuss the fifth problem you may have. With the change from digital to film is controlling ISO, or ASA as we speak of in film talk. In your digital camera, when the weather turns darker or you move inside or it becomes overcast, you can simply change the ISO settings to a higher number. In fact, some digital cameras actually have an auto setting for this and it goes up and down as the camera sees fit. As you know, there is a trade-off when you go very high with the ISO, as it creates noise in the images. Although, to be honest, the manufacturers seem to have really improved on this with the latest cameras. It's the same with film. The higher the ASA, the more grain is visible in the pictures. I will discuss this in deeper detail on a walk in the future. Let's for now accept that a higher ASA film means more grain. Yet again, film manufacturers were starting to overcome this, and it's not really noticeable up to 400 ASA. Of course, it depends on the make and type of film you're using. As I say, this is a discussion for another day. What I'd like to tackle here, when what I promised at the beginning of the video, is what to do if the film you have is simply the wrong ASA for the conditions. Well, if you have a 200 ASA film loaded, which I should expect will be your go-to, as it works in most circumstances, but you find the conditions have changed and become very, very dark, this will leave you with slow shutter speeds or wide apertures, or both. So with C41 colour negative film you can be happy that the film has a latitude of 5 stops. So you could double the ASA on your camera and work at 400 ASA. You could double again to 800 ASA which is 2 stops. You will lose highlights or you could lose shadows but the images will be usable. With black and white film you have more options. You can do the same again but this time tell the person who will develop the film for you that you pushed it by two stops. In this case the development time will change to compensate for the push. The film must be used at the higher ASA for the whole roll if you are going to use push development. If you have 1600 ASA film and it's a bright sunny day I really wouldn't use it. But if you did and you took it down to 200 ASA that would be pulling the film. With colour film you have quite a lot of attitude and with black and white the dev time can compensate for pulling and pushing. Even slide film can be pushed and pulled. There is always a trade-off so it's best to use the right film for the conditions. However, nothing is lost and the ISO problem can be overcome. You may have realised that a good film camera has an exposure compensation dial which is like adding ASA or subtracting ASA 
when you go plus one or plus two, you're going one stop or two stops. And when you do minus one and minus two, you're going minus a stop, minus two stops. Do you see? It's the same as changing the ASA. And if they've put that on the camera, they must have been convinced that film latitude will allow for it. To really get the benefits of the pushing and pulling, you practice, practice, practice. Well, I hope you enjoyed my talk and join me when I continue the walk in part two. Don't forget to like and subscribe as this helps others to see my videos. Do have a look and see what else I can teach you about film photography. And hey, thank you for watching. I've enjoyed having your company.